you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. And today, I want to speak on Christmas communion. Three points. Number one, Jesus' humble birth. Jesus' humble birth. Uh, There was not a birth like his. Number two, Jesus' human life. Now, I think we lose track of this. We think Jesus, and we think of the miracles and all the mighty things he has done, which we need to think of. But you have to understand, he was human. Okay, he hurt. When they pulled his beard, it, it hurt. When they nailed him to the cross, it was excruciating pain. When people said ugly things to him, it hurt and his heart was broken. So I want to see the human side of him also. And then number three, Jesus' horrific death, his horrific death. You know, by law, the Jews were not supposed to crucify anyone. They did it. They, they did their uh, death sentence by stoning. But yet the Romans and the Jews got together, and, and uh, the Jews would just not let up. You know, they, they just, you know, tried to release Barabbas, uh, and the Romans did, and, and they just would not take no for an answer. And, uh, that, you know, the crucifixion, folks, is absolutely one of the most cruel ways a person can die. And most of the time, they hung on the cross long enough to where they just could not breathe any more, and uh, it was a time of suffocation, not for our Lord and Savior uh, because of prophecy in the Old Testament, but it was a cruel, cruel death. And the book of Isaiah was written, and this is amazing, folks, 700 years before the birth of Christ. This great messianic prophecy is found in this scripture in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, and three other places in the New Testament. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is presented as the sinless substitute for all of mankind. His His lowly life, his rejection by his own people, his willingness to suffer and die on a cross, his atoning sacrifice, and his glorious resurrection paved the way for sinners like you and I to receive salvation through grace and faith. Let's look at these wonderful words from God himself as we prepare our hearts and minds for the Lord's Supper. Christmas communion. Number one, Jesus' humble birth. Isaiah 53, verse 1, who hath believed our report? Well, folks, even his own people didn't believe him. Even his own people saw what was going on and saw who he was and the miracles he'd done, and they rejected that. It says in in the second question, and to whom has the arm of the Lord uh, been revealed? And again, folks, uh, there were other people that noticed who Jesus was. There were others that believed in Jesus Christ. There was others that realized that, hey, a man, a simple man cannot do what this man is doing. And the power that he is speaking of is God's power. The power he is speaking of here is the Holy Spirit power. And it indwelled Jesus Christ Him and his father were one. They were one. They were in perfect union with one another. Jesus was truly a reflection of God himself. And then verse 2, For he shall grow uh, grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. And, And again, I think some of this talks about his innocence, okay? Some of this talks about, you know, he is the hope of the world, okay? He is, you know, when even in the the prophetic Old Testament sayings here, uh, it was just really all about Jesus. And that's what's an amazing thing about the Old Testament versus the New Testament. See, in the New Testament and in our lives, we can look back and we see that Jesus lived. And we know in the accounts in the Gospels that Jesus died. But people like Isaiah and the prophets had to believe in a coming Messiah. 
And they knew that this coming Messiah was the hope for the Israelites and and hope uh, for the Jews, and not only them, for the whole world. And it says, a second part of verse 2, and he has no form of comeliness. And again, he just, it, it wasn't that, you know, he wasn't something to look at. That's not what I think he's talking about. He was just a man. He, if you looked at him, you know, you could just see. Uh, he was a Jew, okay? Uh, he, he looked like many others of his day, but it was what was on in him, okay? The Holy Spirit that made him different. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And I think of King Saul in the Old Testament in the first king. He was rather large of stature and a nice-looking man. And folks, there is even deception in beauty, folks. You can see beautiful people, and a lot of times I see Hollywood stars, and, and people envy them. But I am telling you, money will not buy happiness. And there are people that think they have happiness, and, and when they get alone and by themselves, they realize that they are empty inside. But I'm telling you, Jesus was anything but empty, folks. He was full of God. He was God in human flesh. He was the man of God. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, go with me. To Luke chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 4. Luke 2, verse 4. So Joseph went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, and to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was while they were there, the days were complete uh, for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You talk about a humble birth. You talk about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords being a uh, uh, birth in a stable. You're talking about swaddling clothes. You're talking about sheets of cloths that have been torn. There was every indication that Mary and Joseph did not have money, all right? And there was no room in the end. But I am telling you, even though he had the humble birth, and, and not only that, folks, it was a virgin birth, all right? That is so important, okay? God put the Holy Spirit, put Jesus inside of Mary. Joseph uh, was the husband of Mary, but I am telling you, uh, Jesus was born from above. He left the abode of heaven and, and came into this world through Mary, and he was born in a stable. Most people that would be called kings would have been born in a palace. Most people that had a lot of money would have all kinds of servants and people waiting on them, and midwives, and making sure all this was, was good, and everything was clean, and everything was, was sterile. But I'm telling you, he was born as man. He was 100% God and 100% man. So Jesus had a humble birth. The second thing I want you to see not only Jesus had a humble birth, but Jesus' human life, his human life. Back in Isaiah 53, verse 3, he is despised and rejected by men. And again, folks, all Jesus did was try to, to, to get people to see who he was and why he was there. All he tried to do is help mankind he didn't do miracles to show off. All the miracles that he did met a human need, and then he spoke of the spiritual connotation of that miracle. He was 
the bread of life. But yet he was despised by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And again, with I, I just think of Judas, and I still have a hard time wrapping my head around how can a guy spend three years or more with the Son of God and not be changed? And you know what Judas's problem was, folks? It was money. He cared more about money than his eternal destination. Sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Had the audacity to walk up that night and kiss him on the cheek as if he was his friend. And folks, Jesus knew what heartache was. Jesus knew what pain was. Jesus knew what mankind was. But yet, he still loves us anyway. And the Bible says, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Even people in Jesus' day, days avoided him. They didn't want to talk about him. And do you know why? Because of their sin. They didn't want to deal with sin. And we are still the same way today. We hide from God at times. And I'm telling you, it breaks the heart of God. It breaks the heart of Jesus. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Folks, if anything, if anyone uh, deserved the respect of mankind, it was Jesus Christ our Lord. Then verse 4 says, Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. And I remember the scene at the cross where one of the Roman soldiers said, If you are the Son of God, get off the cross and take us with you. Oh, folks, he felt our pain. He feels our hurt. Uh, I truly believe in some ways Jesus was one of the most misunderstood people that ever lived. He just loved people. He was just concerned for people. He came and died for people. Luke chapter 2. Look at Luke 2 with me if you would. Luke 2. Luke 2, verse 47. Luke 2, 47. And this is the story where Jesus was 12 years old and he stayed and he was talking to the scribes and Pharisees in the temple. Uh, Jesus' parents and all his relatives had left. And Jesus was so focused on the temple and uh, he, he loved the synagogues. He loved to read in the synagogues that he didn't even realize his family had left. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answer. We're talking about a 12-year-old kid, okay? 12 years old. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. I mean, she, Jesus was basically getting chewed out by his mom. And look at his answer. And he said unto them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? He wasn't popping off to his mom. He was simply saying, I was so focused in the church. I was so focused in the synagogue. I was so focused on the word of God that I forgot about time and forgot we, had, I, we hadn't even seen one another in 24 hours. And it said, but they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. In verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Oh, I'm telling you, folks, Mary, as the mother of Jesus, I believe with all my heart, 
as soon as he was born and she had him in his arms, the Holy Spirit said, there is definitely something different about this child. Mary watched Jesus, uh, you know, raise and watched Jesus uh, grow. And, I, you know, I know an excuse I like to use with my parents. Well, I'm not perfect. Well, duh. Okay. But you know what? Jesus could say, hey, I'm perfect. But he did. He could have said it. Because he had to be the perfect lamb of God. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. Matthew 20. Matthew 20. Matthew 20, verse 25. And again, we are talking about the disciples here, and we're talking about greatness, and we're talking about mother here, uh, you know, James and John, asking a favor of Jesus. And basically, the disciples were being the disciples, and we're being humans. And, you know, uh, even at that, uh, James and John was, uh, you know, he, he was just basically saying, you know, if you want to be like me, you are going to have to suffer. You are going to have to suffer. In verse 24, it says, And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the ruler of the Gentiles lord over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. And folks, we do. All right? We have, you know, this, we, we put people up in high esteem, okay, and, and we should not do that, okay? I'm just telling you, nobody is perfect except Jesus. And, and sooner or later, if you hang around a person long enough, they are going to disappoint you in some way because of human nature. Verse 26, yet it shall not be among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servants. See, she asked, would you let one sit on the right hand and one sit on the left? What is he saying? Would you let my boys be closest to Jesus? And again, you know, you can't fault the mother for that. But he basically said, listen, folks, you don't understand what is important. What, what is important is that you, you want to be great, then you be a servant. To all was not Jesus the greatest servant that ever lived? Was he not the suffering servant that died on the cross for our sins? In verse 27, and whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Folks, I am telling you. Jesus, if you truly think about it, when he was birthed, he was born to die. You say, well, all of us die not like Jesus did. Not like Jesus, folks. His death gave us life. And then Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And, and have you noticed in the Gospels how Jesus would heal somebody? And what did he say after he healed somebody? Just go your way. Don't tell anybody what happened. Don't tell anybody I was the one. Why? Because his not, time had not come yet. All right, his time had not come. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Oh, folks, truly, and I, I say this sentence, and I mean what I say, you know, dying Folks, is not the hardest part. Dying is not, to me, dying is the easiest part, okay? Because all of us are going to die. There's no exemptions. 
100%, if you live and the rapture doesn't come, you are going to die. All right? And again, I understand how you die and the length it is and all that. I understand some people suffer and some don't. But I'm telling you, the hardest part of life is living the Christian life. Folks, anybody can die for Christ. Anybody. I'm, I'm just telling you, Christians, they do it all the time. They die. And the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It ought, I mean, you really think about that. That's one of the most glorious days we have in our lives. But living for Christ is the challenge. And Jesus died on the cross. Where we see his humble birth, his human life, and his horrific death. Look back in five, chapter 53, 5 and 6. This verse, these two verses are some of my favorite verses in all. Folks, this is the gospel here. This is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus had done for you and I. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. When I think of the beating that he took, I just, in my mind, I, I just cannot wrap my mind around that. At Christa, at, I mean, at Easter time, you know, they're just, you know, in, in the song, Steve, Watch the Lamb is one that is just has a tremendous uh, effect on me when I hear it. To see him on the cross, to see uh, the cat of nine tails, to see him falling with a cross and, and falling on the ground to where he can't even pick himself up to do that. Folks, that's how much Jesus loved us. And I love this next line, and by his stripes we are healed. Folks, there's healing. There's hope. Okay? There's hope and there's healing. There's physical healing, which we all want, and, you know, some get it and some don't. I mean, that's just life. That's the way it is. But let me tell you the greatest healing there is, and that is the healing of the soul. When you invite Jesus Christ to come into your life, when he forgives you of every sin you will ever commit, that is healing. And that lasts forever. Forever and ever. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Every one of us. There's not a perfect person in this building. There's not a perfect person. There's not one who does the right thing every time. And folks, I'm just telling you, he did it anyway. He loves us anyway. His blood was spilled anyway. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Even in the crucifixion, Jesus said the words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In the perfect Lamb of God, in an instant, she, God, laid all of our sin on Jesus Christ. Here is a guy that was 33 years without any sin. He never sinned, and I believe that with all my heart. And when the sin came upon him, when he laid that iniquity, when he paid the price, see, he took our place. We should have been on the cross. We should have suffered, but he did it for us. Matthew 1, Matthew 1, 21. Matthew 1, 21. She shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then the best scripture that describes that Verse 6 is 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. 
2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Folks, God turned his back. God could not look at sin. And he was the one, God was the one, that gave his only begotten son for you and I. For he who made him, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then the last scripture I want to share, Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, 27. Then the soldier of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed a knee before him and mocked him. Folks, this is Jesus. Jesus did not deserve this. Saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him. I would rather somebody punch me in the face than spit on me. Because what you're saying is, you're not worthy of anything. You're dirt. You spit on the ground, folks. And Jesus took it for us and took the reed and struck him on the head. And you know the crazy part about that? He could have wiped out everyone in that room. He could have done it. But folks, he was born to die. He was born for the cross. And when they mocked him, they took a robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Folks, I am telling you to look at the cross. And can you imagine Mary, his mother, watching all that take place? Could you imagine the hurt in her heart and in her life? He could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. He died and took his last breath and he died for you and for I and folks I'm telling you he was laden in the tomb and I know what Satan was thinking <laughs> man it happened we finally got rid of Jesus oh I got news for Satan folks Three days later, he arose from the grave. He's sitting at the right hand of God as we speak right now. He's making intercession for you and I. He is loving us unconditionally. He picks us up when we fall. He tells us it's going to be all right when we are hurting. Jesus did all that for So I'm asking you, this Christmas Eve, I understand presents. I understand putting up lights, and I wouldn't have done it except for my grandkids. <laughs> Lori looked at me. I said, I don't think I'm going to put them up this year. She said, Kylie and Keegan. I said, I'll go get the ladder. Oh, Christmas is not a feeling. It is faith. Faith that we are celebrating the birth of a king. So today as we start this Christmas season, I pray that you won't be like me and be at Scrooge and not want to put up lights. Because one thing that we do have, we have a manger scene. 
And I forgot all about that. Folks, I want my neighbors, I want my, the whole world to know that Jesus' birth needs to be celebrated. That Jesus came and lived a perfect life and died on a cross for you and I. So the Lord's Supper is this. It is a memorial service. It is a memorial service. And it is thanking God for sending his son Jesus Christ. Thanking Jesus for walking the cross. Thanking Jesus that he sacrificed his body and his blood for you and I. If you're here today and don't know Christ, I always give an invitation before the Lord's Supper, always. Because I think it is a time where we can get right with God where we can reflect on what God has done for us and we can do business with God. Folks, we will take the Lord's Supper, but I'm telling you, it's important that we get our hearts ready. These altars are going to be opened up for you. You need to come and just pray. It. Just celebrate Christ. Whatever you need to do. If you need to be saved, please tell us. We would love to talk to you about this Lord that we are talking about. You need to rededicate your life. If you need to come for baptism or you need to join this church, if God has told you to do it, would you do it during this time? Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for Christmas. Thank you that we can begin Christmas, the first Sunday in December, with the Lord's Supper and communion. And God, I pray that. Everyone here, everyone here will get their hearts and their minds and their lives focused on you. God, I pray that they would just listen to the Holy Spirit, and I pray that they would do exactly what the Holy Spirit says. So God, this is your invitation. This is your time, and God, we give it to you. God, you're King of kings and Lord of lords. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for Isaiah 53. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for eternal life. So God, I thank you that you left heaven. You left a perfect place and did all this for us. So God, I pray that we have a heart of gratitude today as we take the Lord's Supper. I pray we have a heart of reflection on all that you have done. God, prepare our hearts even now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.